Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Economics of Health and Education. In uh, week 3, lesson 3 of this course, we will try to understand the causal links between health and socioeconomic status. Now, in socioeconomic literature, there is uh, a lot of resources uh, surrounding uh, this causal link between SES or socioeconomic status and um, health uh, or well being. And a lot of research pertaining to health economics uh, tries to establish this causal link in various socioeconomic contexts. Now, why it is important to understand the causal links? Because understanding these causal links has important policy implications with regard to designing of policy programs, designing of policy programs in different community contexts, uh, designing of different policy programs in different country contexts. Therefore, uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, socioeconomists have paid a lot of attention to these uh, causal links. So, what we will do in today's class is uh, we will first try to understand uh, why it is important to look at these causal links. Uh, you would know that uh, uh, health is uh, demanded globally and there are global disparities in health as well, uh, not just in the developing countries but also across the developed world. The issues uh, pertaining to health disparities in developing countries and developed countries also differ. So, it is in this context that uh, many empirical studies have been attempted globally as well as uh, across uh, different uh, countries uh, in trying to establish this relationship. Now, it is a contentious matter because there are no uh, clear cut uh, conclusions with regard to what are the causal links. Uh, because uh, there are observable variables, there are unobserved variables that explains the causal links. Uh, however, it is important uh, for us as socioeconomists to understand some of the hypotheses that have been forwarded to explain this causal link. So, in this class, we will uh, first you know discuss this relationship between health, socioeconomic status and other variables. How do we conceptualize the uh, directions in which health and socioeconomic status impact each other, uh, followed by a very brief discussion on health inequalities and disparities. Uh, and in uh, we have already been introduced to the Grossman model of health and uh, we will see how Grossman model has been used to understand health disparities by discussing some of the hypotheses that I have listed on the screen. There is efficient producer hypothesis, thrifty phenotype hypothesis, direct income hypothesis and so on and so forth. So, we will take up each of these hypotheses one by one. Now, um, just a little bit of discussion surrounding causal relationship. Now, in uh, socioeconomic studies, when we carry out empirical investigations on uh, what are the determining factors of health and well being, uh, often we carry out socioeconomic surveys. When we carry out socioeconomic surveys, we tend to focus on uh, various variables of interest that may explain uh, the um, health and well being of individuals at different uh, uh, disaggregated levels. Now, um, these links between socioeconomic status and health has actually caught the attention of many economists in developed and developing countries and much of the research in health economics uh, from the point of view of socioeconomists has actually uh, been focused on these issues. So, there is a large and growing literature in this area from social scientists across uh, the spectrum, sociologists, epidemiologists, public health researchers, there are biologists as well uh, who are focused on socioeconomic uh, variables that impact health and well-being. So, health disparities exist in almost all countries across the globe and there is a rich scholarly investigation around the reasons of health disparities and what are the causes thereof. This is a simple visualization of uh, uh, the variables. Uh, you have health, you have SES or socioeconomic status and there are other variables. So, there are some theories that emphasize the effect of socioeconomic status on health. There are others that link health to socioeconomic status and there are some that emphasize on alternate variables that explain the connection between SES and health. So, this figure basically shows the different causal pathways that underlies the various studies surrounding SES and health. Now, to uh, give you uh, some information about what uh, takes place in the Indian context, in the Indian context, the national sample 
uh, survey organization or the national statistical office now uh, has been for over a very long period of time collecting information on morbidity status of individuals. Uh, so, we have information about the general well-being of individuals uh, across the states in India and often uh, there is a lot of studies that have been carried out using the morbidity data to understand its impact on socioeconomic status as well as vice versa understanding the impact of socioeconomic status on health and well-being. And uh, there are many new surveys that have been done in the recent times that has also contributed to this literature. So, when we understand these causal links between SES and health, it will help us to be introduced to some of the research surrounding uh, these areas in our country context as well. Uh, so, that is to justify why it is important, important to look at the causal links between SES and health. Now, let us begin with the first hypothesis that has been uh, widely discussed in uh, economics literature. This is the efficient producer hypothesis and since you have already been introduced to the Grossman model of health production function, uh, you would know that uh, you know some of these uh, discussions are at the center of the Grossman model. So, what does this hypothesis uh, tell us? This hypothesis basically tells us that people who are better educated are more efficient producers of health than those who are less well educated. So, this is a hypothesis that has been empirically tested by various scholars and uh, this hypothesis is at the center of most uh, health uh, related studies in economics. So, Grossman model predicts that people who are more efficient health producers or who have better health outcomes will have uh, higher levels of optimal health. So, if this hypothesis is accurate, we expect health disparity across people with different educational levels such as the mortality education gradient found by Leras and Mune 2005. Now, this is just one of the studies that has found the relationship between uh, education and health and uh, there are many such studies that are conducted in the Indian context as well. Uh, we have also carried out uh, some studies in the context of Assam in India where we have connected education uh, variables to um, morbidity outcomes. So, what does this hypothesis tell us? This hypothesis basically tells us that people who have better education which implicitly means that people who have probably had had better access to resources uh, can optimally utilize their conditions in such a manner that they produce optimal uh, health conditions or they have better health conditions. So, those who are interested can follow this literature that I have mentioned on the slide, education and health evaluating theories and evidence, uh, understanding differences in health behaviors by education, journal of health economics. If you have access to some of these journals, you can uh, look up uh, this uh, paper that gives you the details of how this hypothesis has been empirically tested. Let me give you the example of uh, one uh, paper where they have focused on the possibility that differences in patient self-management can explain the relationship between health and education. They have taken two types of diseases, HIV and type 1 diabetes. And um, these are diseases that require intensive patient participation in treatment. So, for example, HIV patients who are undergoing uh, antiretroviral therapies have to be extremely vigilant about taking multiple drugs daily. Similarly, diabetics who have to calibrate insulin doses several times a day to control their blood sugar also have to be extremely vigilant about their uh, medicine intake or insulin intake on a daily basis. And uh, this study has found that generally highly educated uh, patients, HIV and diabetic patients are more efficient producers of health in the sense that they are better able to self-manage themselves. So, uh, intuitively speaking, it makes sense that people who are better educated will be better able to self-manage themselves. Uh, however, uh, there are uh, other studies which have also uh, found that there is uh, not much relationship that can be established uh, between education and, um, uh, and health status because there are various other unobserved factors also that may impact the health status of an individual other than education. Uh, for example, uh, in a rural uh, context in India, it is not very hard to imagine that even if you may be better educated than say another individual who is living in an urban area, but if you do not have access to hospitals or medical care, it may not show up adequately 
in your health status. So while there seems to be an intuitive and uh, relationship which is why this hypothesis, efficient producer hypothesis, better educated individuals have better health status, many empirical studies have proved so. However, uh, we need to consider other variables that may also uh, confound this uh, relationship. The second hypothesis that has been discussed uh, quite extensively in the economics literature is the thrifty phenotype hypothesis. Uh, now this is referred also referred to as the Barker hypothesis after uh, Barker himself. So this one says that health outcomes throughout life are determined in part by deprivation that occurs in early childhood or even in the uterus or the womb. So this one places a lot of emphasis on the uh, the economic conditions or the environment of the child uh, when he or she was growing and what impact the uh, deprivation has on the health conditions of individuals over, a, over the lifespan of the individual. Now these are kinds of studies that have, are being extensively carried out in the developing countries uh, today where uh, the focus has been on child nutrition. Uh, you must have heard about various kinds of nutrition intervention programs among children, health intervention programs among children and uh, although not all, some of the programs, uh, program interventions that are being carried out in a developing country context uh, takes part of the explanation from the thrifty phenotype hypothesis. So, children from poorer families might suffer more deprivation during gestation and infancy which may explain observed health disparities over the lifespan. Uh, let us understand what exactly is this thrifty phenotype hypothesis. This one suggests that the link between early deprivation and negative uh, health outcomes is a result of some gene activation. So, when children are born under conditions of resource deprivation, they are more likely to activate certain thrifty genes that optimize for deprived conditions. So, certain genes are activated that helps them to adapt to the deprived conditions that they are experiencing in their childhood. For example, under conditions of famine, thrifty phenotype hypothesis suggests that in children certain genes may be activated that instruct their cells to hold fat within the body. And these children when they are well adapted for famine conditions may actually suffer relatively poor health when they go into abundant resource environment. So when they transition from resource deprived environment in their childhood to uh, resource rich environment in their adulthood, they may suffer from obesity and various kinds of lifestyle diseases. And uh, this is something that is being discussed uh, quite extensively in the developing countries context today uh, when we are seeing uh, an epidemiological transition whether it is double burden of health, of ill health or uh, well-being in India in, in developing countries context today where we see both high malnourishment rates on the one hand and obesity and um, overweight issues among adolescents and uh, early teens on the other. So, the thrifty phenotype hypothesis explains part of this phenomenon in the developing countries context. Uh, so, as I just said the thrifty genes that may be helpful for overcoming deprivation conditions during infancy may actually predispose these children to obesity and other undesirable health outcomes in adulthood. And there are many such investigations that are being carried out in developing countries context to understand adolescent ob obesity or adolescent overweight issues uh, ta taking after this hypothesis. Uh, in the developed world there are various uh, such studies supporting the thrifty phenotype hypothesis earlier. Uh, for example, Wattsworth and Kuh 1997, uh, Konius and Spice 2012 in the context of Germany and I have provided details of these uh, references at the end of the uh, lecture. Uh, so, those who are interested may want to look into these uh, papers as well. I will just slightly elaborate on the Wattsworth and Kuh paper which is based on the British National Cohort Study of Children Born in 1946 which showed that individuals with low birth weight, slow fetal growth or respiratory illnesses during childhood were more likely to suffer from a lifestyle diseases such as hypertension or COPD which is called the chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases and schizophrenia as adults. Similar kinds of findings were also found by 
Cornelius and Spice 2012 in the context of Germany. However, it is worth pointing out that we still do not have strong causal links between early life deprivation and poor health outcomes in adult life. There are many unobserved variables that can also explain uh, this uh, causal, uh, this link between early life deprivation uh, between and poor health outcomes in adult life. However, it is important to understand that this hypothesis exists and it is being investigated and it has been investigated in various country contexts and there are some important conclusions to be drawn from this hypothesis which is where program designing and policy interventions have been carried out because of these uh, causal links. The third hypothesis is that of uh, direct income hypothesis. So, this hypothesis suggests that health disparities arise because the rich have more resources available to uh, invest in health and uh, therefore, if the rich have more resources to invest in health that gives rise to better health outcomes for them vis-a-vis -vis those who do not have enough resources to invest in health. Now, this is not a surprising assumption as the rich are usually better off in many dimensions of wealth and well-being that allows them to spend on health improving goods. So, for example, the rich are better able to send their children off to education, they study in better schooling environments, uh, they have better access to uh, hygiene conditions, uh, they have better access to information about uh, uh, health improving goods and uh, home goods and so on. So, when we take into account all of these uh, pathways that can uh, help uh, in contributing to um, uh, health and well-being, it is not really surprising that income or uh, wealth is seen to be an important um, causal link as far as health status is concerned. Now, I must also point out that uh, while we are in the, in the world of uh, research in this area uh, where a lot of emphasis is paid on uh, wealth and income as uh, directly uh, impacting the health status of individuals, there are also studies that have um, uh, downplayed the importance of uh, uh, wealth and income. Uh, because when the focus is more on wealth and uh, on uh, an income, the importance given to various other factors such as nutrition interventions or in other enabling conditions that may impact the well-being of an individual is underestimated. So, uh, which is where I mentioned that this is, these are all contentious matters where uh, empirical investigations uh, need to be carried out increasingly uh, to be able to understand the causal links. In a Swedish study of healthcare lottery participants, uh, it was shown that a lottery win uh, that increased income by just 10 percent decreased a 5 year mortality rate from 6 percent to 4 percent in a sample. So, this is basically to say that as income increases, it does have an impact on the morbidity and mortality conditions uh, in uh, different uh, community contexts or in different population. We have also carried out studies in the context of India. Uh, using the uh, National Family Health Survey data which we will do in the last phase of this course and uh, we have, I uh, will discuss the paper that we have done where we have shown that uh, wealth scores or uh, wealthy uh, individuals do seem to be having uh, better health status or better nutrition status which uh, ultimately impacts the health of an individual. Now, uh, we can understand this with the help of this uh, figure here also. So, this figure uh, shows on the x axis we have health goods or uh, medical care, on the y axis uh, home goods or other consumption goods are uh, shown. Now, there are two individuals, uh, individual R, this person is a rich individual and UR shows the rich individuals in difference curve and P is a poor individual and UP shows the poor individuals in difference curve. On the y axis ZR shows the combination of uh, the goods and services that the rich individual, uh, the home goods that the rich individual consumes. Uh, similarly, on the y axis uh, ZP star uh, shows the uh, home goods that the uh, poor individual consumes. Now, let me remind you here that we have already seen the utility function where we uh, see that the individuals prefer uh, consumption of medical goods or health goods and other consumption goods. So, sometimes these other consumption goods are also referred to as home goods. So, on the y axis Z refers to the home goods or other consumption goods and on the x axis 
uh, H refers to the uh, health improving goods or uh, medical care. So, the richer individual uh, here R earns higher wages than the poorer individual P and therefore has more money at her disposal or the real income of the richer individual is more both uh, nominal income, money income as well as real income is more. Consequently, you will see that the production possibility curve, this is the production possibility curve here is shifted outward and her optimal level of health is also higher. So, just this is the optimal level of uh, health H star R of the rich individual uh, which is uh, found at the point of um, tangency of the uh, rich individuals indifference curve and the rich individuals production possibility curve. Uh, similarly, the optimal health of the poor individual is H p star which is at the tangency of the uh, indifference curve of the poorer individual and the production possibility uh, frontier or the curve of the poorer individual. So, the production possibility curve of the poor and rich is basically to show that the rich has more resources at her disposal to be able to spend on H and Z. So, for rich individual R, her optimal level of health H and home good Z are both higher than the optimal levels of the poorer counterpart. So, this hypothesis gives you a model uh, to test empirically uh, whether wealth using wealth data or income data and testing the wealth data and income data on the socioeconomic variables of the individual including health and to see whether uh, it is income or wealth is uh, can be an important significant expl explanatory factor with regard to the health status of individuals. So, this hypothesis gives you a model to be able to test your uh, empirical data. The fourth hypothesis is uh, allostatic load hypothesis. Now, uh, this hypothesis also is intuitively makes sense. Now, this hypothesis emphasizes stress as the main mechanism linking socioeconomic status and health. It tells us that the stress response in humans is vitally important to survival. Now, while this is the objective statement of the allostatic load hypothesis, you will see that this uh, statement has important policy implications. Uh, with respect to different groups of population or different communities living in different socioeconomic environments. Now, if you recall in the Grossman model, the aging process is captured in the rate of depreciation of health capital given by the delta. A person under prolonged or repeated stress has a higher rate of depreciation uh, or uh, the depreciation in the aging process is much higher than a person who lives a more relaxed life at the same biological age. So, here the hypothesis is that if there are two individuals A and B uh, and if A has more stress than B, then the rate of depreciation during the aging process that A experiences will be much higher than that of B. Now, here if we replace A and B with R and P, the richer person and the poorer person, so then uh, uh, this hypothesis says that stress plays an important role here. And eventually using various kinds of empirical studies, it has been proved that poorer individuals seem to have more stresses in their lives that ultimately impacts their uh, optimal uh, production of health at the individual level. So, under conditions of high stress, optimal health will be lower because health investment is less worthwhile. So, if your stress levels are high, then even if you are investing more and more on health improving goods, your optimal health will be lower because the rate of depreciation that you are experiencing on your health conditions is very high. So, this holds even though the efficiency of health production is the same, even though both individuals fa face the same marginal efficiency curve. So, this can be shown uh, visually here in this uh, figure on the x axis uh, is uh, shown health and the y axis returns on health. So, the we have already been introduced to the marginal efficiency curve. Um, R plus uh, delta H shows high levels of depreciation or high rate of depreciation and R plus delta L shows low levels of depreciation or low rate of depreciation. So, this figure basically shows that even though both individuals face the same MAC curve, an individual who is experiencing repeated stress or prolonged stress faces a higher rate of uh, depreciation which is delta H and chooses a lower optimal health here. The person who faces higher uh, prolonged stress chooses a 
lower optimal health level as a result and such repeated stress or prolonged stress creates a cumulative physiological burden and this burden is known as the allostatic load. So, the allostatic load theory predicts that people on the lower end of the socioeconomic status suffer more stress and face uh, worse health outcomes. Now, it is important that we point out that there are no conclusive studies providing causal links supporting the allostatic load hypothesis. Several studies have found an association between socioeconomic status and stress. Many have found no association while some have found an opposite relationship. And this is important to consider in the context of socioeconomic studies where the context is very important. What is the context in which we are carrying out the study uh, helps us understand uh, which hypothesis uh, can make more sense. Uh, however, uh, in the uh, recent years, allostatic load or uh, stress as uh, playing an important role in the well-being of individuals has come to receive increasing attention and therefore, uh, we will list it as one of the important hypothesis in health economics. The fifth is the income inequality hypothesis. Uh, most developing countries across the world face very high levels of income inequality and there is a lot of uh, discussion surrounding socioeconomic disparities uh, being widened because of income inequality because when there is income inequality your access to various socioeconomic goods and services also uh, differs based upon your income and accompanied by uh, inflationary rise in prices and declining real incomes of individuals, declining real wages of individuals, income inequality hypothesis is a very important uh, study in the context of uh, socioeconomic status and health well-being. So, this hypothesis uh, tells us that societies with more unequal income distributions will have worse health outcomes. So, if a society is more unequal, if the income inequality is very high, then it is uh, expected that health outcomes will be worse off uh, and that will also have important policy implications for different sections of the population. And it is important to note here that we are not just discussing about absolute income levels here that determine health, health outcomes, but the distribution of income within a society. It is looking at the distributive effects of um, various kinds of income policies or uh, economic policies that are followed in the country. So, the income inequality hypothesis has policy implications in terms of its distributive effects. So, uh, policy makers have to pay attention to health outcomes of worse off communities and population. And there is a vast literature on social inequality and health outcomes using different levels of aggregated data at the state, national and international level. And one of the charges leveled against these studies is that they are vulnerable to omitted variable uh, bias. So, there are although there are empirical studies in this uh, context uh, at the macro level, at the country level or at the global level to be able to uh, establish a causal link between income inequality and uh, health disparities is a tall order. And, uh, but generally there is a, there is a broad understanding that uh, inequality or income inequality will definitely lead to a situation uh, which makes the poorer sections of the society worse off and that invites policy attention to the uh, worse off sections of the community including health policies design and intervention. There is a sixth hypothesis that is discussed in the context of health economics and this is referred to as the access to care hypothesis. This hypothesis advances the idea of differences in access to health care as the reason for health disparities. Now, you would see that this also has uh, some uh, similarity with the other hypothesis that we have studied for example, efficient producer hypothesis. So, let us say uh, somebody who is better educated or even direct income hypothesis, somebody who has more income will usually always have better access to health care. So, for example, a better educated person and a person uh, who has um, better incomes than another will also have a better insurance policy for example, which is a representation of access to health care. So, this hypothesis uh, advances the idea of differences in access to health care 
uh, as I have just mentioned that uh, those with high income can afford more generous health insurance schemes while those with lower incomes cannot and therefore they face higher prices for care. Uh, various studies have shown that low self-reported access to care is strongly predictive of higher rates of hospitalization for chronic conditions. So, for example, uh, lower sections of the society or uh, communities which are worse off in terms of access to uh, health care, uh, self-reported access to health care which means that they have not had any access to preventive medicine or preventive care because of various reasons ultimately see very high rates of hospitalization for chronic diseases because these diseases have not been managed adequately when it could have been at the preventable stage. So, those who have reported low self care access uh, can be people who are in uh, poorer persons who do not have adequate levels of income or amounts of income to be able to access private health care. It could also uh, be an outcome of a situation where there is an absence of health care facilities altogether or if there is restricted health care facilities available, uh, government, private or different kinds of uh, combinations of public private partnerships in provision of health care that may lead to a situation where uh, rates of hospitalization increases for chronic conditions because of having uh, low access to care in the first stage. So, hospitalizations could have been preventable if they had access to care at earlier stages. Uh, we have discussed the RAND insurance study earlier and the Oregon Medicaid uh, studies earlier and these studies have also found supporting evidence with respect to uh, these, uh, this hypothesis as a result of which uh, in the current context uh, in many countries across the globe, universal health care has become uh, a mantra for health systems uh, particularly with regard to those sections of the population who cannot have access to uh, um, health care because of low incomes. The seventh is the productive time hypothesis. Now, this hypothesis tells us uh, that the changes in health can also affect socioeconomic status. So far, we have been discussing about how socioeconomic status impacts health. Here we see how changes in health can also impact socioeconomic status, which is why if you can recall the visual representation of socioeconomic status, health status and uh, other variables, we saw that the pathways are all interconnected. Sometimes health can impact uh, SES, uh, sometimes SES can impact health and sometimes there can be other unobservable variables that may impact both health and socioeconomic status. So, Grossman model predicts that worsening health diminishes productive time. So, if your rate of depreciation of health is very high or if the aging process is intensified because of various uh, process or your health conditions deteriorate uh, because of uh, various uh, reasons, then the amount of productive time that you have uh, declines and hence the ability to produce income. So, health status has an important uh, association with uh, workforce status has an important association with work time productivity. This is called the productive time hypothesis. Scholars such as Smith uh, did a health and retirement survey based study in the US and found the severe impact of health status on wealth creation. They found that the impact of health status on days of work lost or workforce conditions is an important area of study in health economics. Uh, even today, the uh, days uh, lost due to ill health is an important measure that is um, measured for understanding the health outcomes in developing countries and the developed countries. We will discuss these measures when we come to the data sources uh, component in the final part of this course. Now, this table here is based upon the Smith 1999 study. This is based upon a survey. The first column here shows the uh, health status of individuals who have been surveyed, people who had excellent health condition, very good, good and poor health conditions in 1984 and their wealth status was reported in 1984 in 1994. And you would see that people who had excellent health conditions continued to increase their wealth in 1994. Similarly, for those who were in very good health status and in good health status, but those who had poor health status had reduced overall uh, wealth uh, score or wealth conditions after a 10 year period. 
So this is one of the studies which has uh, strongly established uh, the importance impact of health on uh, wealth generation over a period of time. So, uh, which means that if you are in a better health condition today that increases your productive time and hence your ability to produce income in a future uh, period of time and therefore the productive and this is what is referred to as production of health in uh, the earlier class when we discussed the Grossman model, we discussed as the model uh, talking about consumption of health and production of health. So, this is what is referred to as the production of health where health determines your productive time and your uh, capacity to generate wealth in the short run as well as in the long run. And this, these kinds of studies has very important policy implications in uh, various country contexts which means that uh, health sometimes is not just uh, a capital uh, good but also has to be seen in as a basic right. Uh, because it is uh, connected to a right to employment as well. Uh, this is the final hypothesis that we will study today. This is referred to as the time preference hypothesis also called the Fuchs hypothesis which was discussed in 1982 by Fuchs. So, this suggests that the observed correlation between socioeconomic status and health is actually caused by an unobserved third variable and this unobserved third variable is patience. Uh, similar kinds of studies have been carried out in the economics of education as well. So, this one says that people who are patient have more tolerance and are willing to invest more in both education and health status. There is a study, there are studies uh, which are carried out in the context of education with regard to an individual demanding education up till the level of uh, secondary education or an individual preferring to stay in higher education because you are foregoing the opportunity of other pleasures if you are continuing to remain in higher education and this is referred to as an ob unobservable um, talent in the context of education in the context of health referred to as patients where your tolerance level is high and therefore you are willing to invest more and more on education and health and that impacts your uh, productivity. So, patients may explain the correlation between health and education which means that higher educated people who are more patient to stay in education have an outward shifting marginal efficiency curve that also impacts higher levels of health achievements. Ultimately, the efficiency of an individual increases because of an unobserved third variable and in this case it is referred to as uh, patience. So, what we have done uh, today is we have discussed a few hypotheses that are some of the common investigations carried out in the field of socioeconomic studies on health and each of the theories outlined uh, works within the logic of the Grossman model that we have discussed and each one explains the connection between health and socioeconomic status in its own ways. There are no clear cut causal links between health and socioeconomic status as I have mentioned in this course that it is always context specific it is always country specific. So, there are various socioeconomic contexts within which these causal links have to be understood. Given the country or community context, each hypothesis outlined can provide different results that may have important policy implications. So, we have efficient producer hypothesis, thrifty phenotype hypothesis, direct income effect and allostatic load hypothesis that describe ways in which more wealth or better education lead to improved health. So, here we are talking about the pathways that link socioeconomic status to health. So, health becomes the health outcomes becomes a dependent variable here and the independent variables are education or income. Productive time hypothesis reverses the causal argument and says that improved health leads to better socioeconomic status. So, here socioeconomic status becomes the dependent variable and health conditions or the choice of health goods becomes an important independent variable that explains the socioeconomic status. So, the causal link or the pathway is from health to socioeconomic status. Fuchs hypothesis argues that patients or time discounting determines both health and wealth. So, the amount of time and energy that you are um, ready to invest in health and education ultimately determines your marginal efficiency curve 
or the efficiency that you are uh, portraying in the market of education and health. Uh, this is referred to an unobservable uh, quality or unobservable variable uh, that explains the better health, optimal health conditions uh, in the context of health. And we have similar such concepts in the context of education as well, where talent is considered as an unobservable variable that contributes to the marginal efficiency curve of the individual. So, each of these areas are an active and contentious area of research and it is still large and uh, growing. Now, while we discuss that there are these are contentious issues, we must also point out that there are a few well established links in health economics and uh, I have listed some of them here. First is that if two or more individuals have the same resource base, even with the same resources, better educated people are more efficient producers of health. And we have discussed this that you know if two or more individuals have the same levels of income, uh, education becomes an important determining factor with respect to their efficient producers of health. So, uh, just having similar levels of income, but with no information about how to manage your diseases or how to um, understand the disease profile of a country or how to um, participate in uh, the disease management or how to participate in the demand for health goods uh, can become an important determining factor as far as the health status is concerned. And uh, this is where the role of education is very important in the context of demand for health as well. And therefore, health, demand for health and education are seen as uh, the combination of goods that requires social sector interventions by governments so that it can be provided uh, universally to different sections of the population. Second is that early life health events seem to have an important consequence throughout the lifespan of the individual. And there are uh, very well established links in health economics in this context as well. Uh, so, which is why you would see that the focus on child nutrition, child health intervention has been one of the significant policy frameworks in countries such as India, where significant funds have been, uh, have been spent, uh, significant policy designs have been carried out in the context of child health and nutrition intervention, uh, even uh, uh, correcting for malnutrition among children uh, also has an age limit which is why the focus on 0 to 6 age group of children where nutrition rehabilitation centers in the Indian context have been established across the states uh, because there is a time limit within which the reversal of health and nutrition can take place in the children uh, because it has important consequences for the entire lifespan of the ch of children. And by now you must have uh, seen how uh, health is connected to uh, education and uh, workforce. So, uh, when uh, nutrition interventions and health interventions are carried out on children that leads to uh, quality workforce in the country and therefore, uh, economic output or economic growth uh, uh, in the country. So, therefore, there is a clear cut link between uh, nutrition interventions and economic growth in the country and it is in this context that the uh, early life deprivations need to receive policy focus. Third is that uh, there is a causal link between established links between stress and uh, health disparities. Stress has an important role in producing health disparities and this is seen across different sections of the population rich or poor and in the context of uh, developing countries or poorer countries of the world it has been seen that poorer individuals uh, even in the context of developed countries, it has been seen that poorer individuals or worse off communities seem to have a higher allostatic load that contributes to health disparities. And therefore, again, uh, this has policy implications with regard to designing specific interventions for lower income individuals so as to reduce the allostatic load which can in the long run impact their uh, work status or workforce participation as well. Equal access to care may not uh, eliminate health disparities. Uh, there is a well established link in health economics as far as this is concerned that even if two individuals have equal access to care, health disparities may not be eliminated because there are other factors that may contribute to uh, health disparities. Uh, like for example, you may have equal access to care, but you may not have equal access to education 
or uh, because education is such an important determining factor as far as health outcomes is concerned. So, even if you have equal access to care, your lower education may impact, uh, may lead to worse of health outcomes. Similarly, you may have equal access to care, but since with the help of your higher education, you may be better able to self-manage yourself that uh, contributes uh, positively to uh, health outcomes. Finally, health and socioeconomic status have bidirectional relationship. Therefore, when we are uh, pursuing research in the context of health economics, utilizing socioeconomic data uh, to understand the its impact on health or vice versa, we need to exercise caution uh, and we need to uh, uh, look into each of the variables uh, carefully before we can uh, come up with causal links. Establishing causal links between health and socioeconomic status is widely carried out in uh, different country contexts and is at the center of uh, health economics and that must be, uh, that needs to be understood carefully. So, what we have done in today's uh, class is uh, we have tried to understand the socioeconomic disparities or health disparities that are discussed in the context of health economics. Now, uh, we are ending uh, the discussion on demand for health with this class in this week. Uh, we have understood the Grossman model, we have understood the comparative statics using the Grossman model, how to put all of the components uh, uh, together uh, to be able to use the Grossman model. Uh, we have uh, also understood uh, the uh, different uh, uh, insurance, large insurance programs that have been carried out, uh, experiments that have been carried out and some of the uh, major conclusions uh, surrounding the, um, the, the nature of demand curve for health care uh, in, uh, in the context of health economics. And finally, today we studied some of these hypotheses that helps us to determine uh, or investigate the uh, various empirical studies uh, in the context of uh, uh, health disparities and socioeconomic status. Now, there are various policy implications of these uh, studies. Uh, to name a few, for example, if we are doing a study on different hypotheses, we will be better able to develop policies as well as um, carry out resource allocation. Uh, this could involve uh, increasing access to education, improving housing conditions, ensuring fair employment opportunities, resources can be um, uh, allocated more efficiently to interventions that uh, address root causes rather than uh, symptoms, potentially reducing healthcare costs in the long run. So, uh, if we are let us say looking at the efficient producer hypothesis or we are looking at income inequality as the hypothesis or we are looking at the allostatic load, it helps us to determine various other components within the economy, various other policy areas within the economy. Similarly, targeted interventions can be carried out uh, by following these kinds of empirical studies, whether we want to focus on which are the sections of the population we want to focus on is an important area. Uh, for example, if poor nutrition is uh, found to be a key link between low socioeconomic status and uh, poor health, then food assistance programs can be prioritized. And this is something that is extensively carried out in countries such as India and many other developing countries across the world where uh, the focus has been on uh, universal uh, subsidized food uh, assistance programs or um, uh, cash, for, uh, 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 cash transfer programs and so on. Uh, similarly, these hypotheses also helps us to understand reduction of health inequalities by understanding the bidirectional relationship between health and SES. It can uh, help reduce health inequalities and policies can be crafted to simultaneously uh, improve health and SES creating a positive uh, feedback uh, loop. There are various economic benefits when we are trying to understand these uh, causal links uh, because reducing healthcare costs can be associated with treating chronic conditions whether the uh, as a policy makers need to focus on preventive healthcare or they need to focus on uh, tertiary healthcare. Uh, this, these are the kinds of empirical studies that can be carried out that helps us determine um, you know, what is the policy focus that needs to be carried out in a country uh, context. Similarly, these studies also have intergenerational impact. When we understand the causal links, it can help us break the poverty cycle and uh, it can help us break the link 
that passes down poverty uh, to uh, different generations. Interventions targeting younger children uh, can have long lasting uh, effects on their health and economic uh, uh, prospects. Uh, for example, many studies have been carried out in countries including Japan uh, and India currently where uh, because of sustained interventions on the health of children, it has been seen that uh, the uh, health outcomes intergenerationally have improved. For example, in India today, stunting rates have, uh, have improved which means that uh, there have been intergenerational gains as far as health outcomes are concerned. And this has been possible primarily because of the sustained uh, investments, public investments that have been carried out on uh, health and nutrition and education of children. We have had midday meal programs, we have had successfully running integrated child development services and so on, which are nutrition intervention programs which seem to have uh, started taking, uh, uh, started taking, uh, uh, bringing positive results by reducing stunting rates over a period of time and stunting is an anthropometric indicator which uh, indicates uh, intergenerational uh, uh, nutrition uh, poverty. Uh, so, if stunting rates have declined that uh, that definitely means that we have improved uh, nutritionally over a, a period of time. Similarly, public awareness and advocacy can be introduced uh, because of uh, these kinds of studies, uh, these uh, kinds of empirical investigations. Improved data and research is one of the important components that uh, socioeconomic st uh, health status and uh, socioeconomic status and health status causal links can help us understand. It can also promote uh, methodological advances in uh, causal inference, enhancing the robustness of findings in health economics. So, uh, these are the references that I have used for this lecture. The major reference is the Palgrave Macmillan Health Economics uh, by Jay Bhattacharya and others uh, published in 2014. This is a textbook that I have also suggested for the learners of this course. And there are other references that are cited in the textbook which I have also used and to explain the various hypotheses. The interested learner can look into each of these papers if you have access to uh, understand the empirical investigations that have been carried out um, uh, across uh, many countries in the world and that will ha also help you, those of you who are interested in carrying out empirical investigations yourself can uh, take examples from these uh, papers uh, to uh, utilize the Indian data sets or other country, developing countries data sets to test the hypothesis that we have discussed. So, with this we end today's class. In the next class, we will discuss the supply side of healthcare economics. Thank you. Mm -hmm.